You know, in thinking about it, I decided I wanted a poet to talk about this one because poetry, arguably, there are people that believe that it was actually invented to woo women. <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, love poems. Uh, and everybody, I think, who's ever really been in love will take their stab at poetry. Of course. Yeah, I mean, there's probably been a lot of doggerel written as a result of, of being in love. But everybody will, you know, even if it's roses are red, violets are blue, I have to tell you, there's no one like you. <laughs> so that was off the top of the head. I'm a, I'm a poet. You know, I didn't know it. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, so Christopher Marlowe, come live with me and, and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove. Right. So I wanted to talk with a poet about this subject, and, and then I thought, I'd, I'd really like Amir Suleiman, because you're actually one of the few poets that I know. I know a lot of people that take their stab at poetry, but I actually consider you a bona fide poet. And, and I really, I, w I don't say that about a lot of people, but um, uh, that's how I feel about you. So I thought we could talk about this thing. So to kick it off, let me read you something um, from Dorothy Sayers, who I actually admire immensely. A lot of people know her for, for her um, mystery novels. But I actually know her for her um, work on Dante and then for her essays and, and her theology. I've written, I've read um, her books on like Creed or Chaos, which I actually really enjoyed. So she says that, um, you know, whenever she brings up the seven deadly sins, people say things like, oh, what are the other six? <laughs> and so she says about the sin of, the, 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 the Romans called it luxuria, which, which is lust, from we get luxury, obviously. So she says about the sin called luxuria, or lust, I shall therefore say only three things. First, that it is a sin and that it ought to be called plainly by its own name and neither huddled away under the ger generic term like immorality, nor confused with love. Secondly, that up till now, and this to me is such an interesting insight. Secondly, that up till now, the church in hunting down this sin has had the act of alliance of Caesar, in other words, the government, who has been concerned to maintain family solidarity and the orderly devolution of property in the interests of the state. But now that contract and status is held to be the basis of society, Caesar need no longer rely on the family to maintain social solidarity. And now that so much property is held anonymously by trusts and joint stock companies, the laws of inheritance lose a great deal of their importance. Consequently, Caesar is now much less interested than he was in sleeping arrangements of his citizens and has in this matter cynically denounced his alliance with the church. I and mean, that just really floored me, that insight. This is a warning against putting one's trust in any child of man, particularly in Caesar. If the church is to continue her campaign against lust, she must do so on her own, that is, on sacramental grounds. And she will have to do it, if not in defiance of Caesar, at least without his insistence. And now it's in defiance of Caesar. Like now, I'm part of an amicus brief now about this very issue um, where, you know, they're trying to take away nonprofit status for people that don't preach free love and, you know, all these things out there. Now here, thirdly, this is her third point. There are two main reasons for which people fall into the sin of luxuria. It may be through sheer exuberance of animal spirits, in which case a sharp application of the curb may be all that is needed to bring the body into subjection and remind it of its proper place in the scheme of man's twofold nature. Or, and this commonly happens in periods of disillusionment like our own, when philosophies are bankrupt 
and life appears without hope. Men and women may turn to lust in sheer boredom and discontent, trying to find in it some stimulus which is not provided by the drab discomfort of their mental and physical surroundings. When that is the case, stern rebukes and restrictions are worse than useless. It is as though one were to endeavor to cure anemia by bleeding. It only reduces further an already impoverished vitality. The mournful and medical aspect of 20th century pornography and promiscuity strongly suggests that we have reached one of these periods of spiritual depression where people wow. go to bed because they have nothing better to do. So what do you, what, what's opening insights? The part actually that, that she mentioned that I thought about immediately was just contrasting it to love. Like I find lust to be like a counterfeit love. You know, it's like the difference between, you know, fine wine and like grape soda. You know, it's like this uh, counterfeit uh, pretend um, uh, and not, I mean, obviously we're not talking about actual wine here, but like. Yeah, we'd choose the grape soda. <laughs> I know, right? Exactly. That's actually the, the hell out version. But you understand the point that I'm making. Yeah. Um, you know, like a red flavored Kool-Aid as opposed to, you know. Right, real actual, fruit juice. You know, fruit, fruit juice. But it's very interesting because both of them produce or both of them result in a type of pain, a type of discomfort. When the lovers write their poetry, even the lovers of God, it's uh, mostly it's, it's poetry of pain often, you know. It's about a, a suffering, a longing, you know. Um, and likewise, a lust also ends or lends itself to this insatiable um, uh, desire that only increases the chasm that is trying to be filled uh, by it. And so it's, uh, it's, it reminds me of something like the difference between H2O and H2O2, you know? One is water and one is like hydrogen peroxide, where and you would think it's a subtle difference. It's only one more oxygen. It's a, uh, but that chemical change results in a radically different experience, a radically different uh, material. And, um, and so to the untrained eye, the lover and the lustful may appear to be traveling on the same path, um, but, uh, but in truth, it's not. It's a subtle but chemical change that results in it being an actually fundamentally different thing, a different experience. And one of the primary experiences of course, you know, in our tradition is the end result of the affair of what it does in the material world and one's material life and how it results in one's afterlife. And then also in one's material life and their, you know, um, spiritual life, the, the, the end result of, of that. But as I started to reflect on it, I was like, man, it really seemed to share, I can understand how someone can mixed it, uh, uh, not be able to make a distinction between the two. But those who've tasted even something of it, they find it different. And like you said, even if it's just uh, a man falls in love with a woman, he's desired other women before. He's spent his whole life, you know, from puberty on desiring this one, that one, this one, that one. But then he's struck with, and even when he looked at people who were in love, he might say, uh, he might think that he has experienced something like that person is experiencing, but that person is handling it poorly. Like, yeah, I've I've also desired a woman before, but you're you know you, you can't handle it. You're letting you know you're letting this overcome you until that one tastes something from true love, and they uh, they you know experience it and then they you know try to hand that poetry and then they want to write songs and <laughs> uh, write poetry and. They find themselves wanting to do things, do things and, and be different. Uh, but it's still tied to a to a to a pain. You know, it's still tied to a it's still tied to a longing. It's still tied to it can be until someone can continue to ascend, like it it's still tied to a fear. Um like when uh, when I had my my first child, my daughter, 
in the first day that we brought her home, and I'm looking at her and in the crib, and I'm like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And I feel like a part of my heart opened. It was as if there was a, uh, like a vacant part of my heart. It's like a, the Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. Like there was a door that was always there, but then I opened it, and there's this whole world in there, right? And, uh, but it was also tied to this fear. Like, look at this little, delicate, weak, incapable of anything. And she's relying on me for everything besides breathing and blinking. And the fear of losing her was tied almost inextricably with my, this profound love. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a slippery, it's a, it's a very uh, delicate nuance between the two. Well, and, and I mean, arguably, that element that moves into love often begins with some kind of physical desire, physical attraction. The Prophet Sallallahu once a man uh, said that he was going to marry uh, somebody, he said, have you seen her yet? You know, that because he said that there should be some attraction, that, that's important. Although... Imam al-Ghazali has an amazing story uh, in his, uh, when he talks about kasr al-shahwatayn, breaking the two desires. He mentions a man who was engaged to a woman that he'd never seen because often marriages, as you know, were arranged then. And uh, the woman, get, she got um, smallpox and ended up really uh, ruining her face. So the family was distraught. Well, the man got news of this, and because he was such a profoundly spiritual man, he actually uh, found somebody who had uh, conjunctivitis and infected his eyes, and then he, he pretended to be blind. Wow. <laughs> Imam al-Ghazali mentions that, and lived with this woman, making her think that he was blind. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that she wouldn't feel bad about how she looked, because... Women, women, you know, one of the things that strikes me about growing old with somebody is that they get more beautiful if you're in love with them. Like women, women, they think you're, you're making it up when you say you're beautiful. Nah, I'm old and I'm wrinkly and I'm this and I'm that. But when the love is there, they really, they become, it's like your mother. You look at your mother's face, she could look like an old, haggard woman but to you she's beautiful because she's your mother and that's what love does you know they say beauty's in the eye of the beholder i mean that's not totally true because there are uh, aesthetic truths out there um, like this should be beautiful to most people if, that they have a healthy aesthetic sense but there really is a lot of truth that beauty is skin deep in that way that that uh, you know the external is something that is not as important as people think. You know, I was thinking also, the other thing I was thinking about what you said about loneliness and lust. Um, and just uh, some poetry here. Uh, there's a great um, song about a one-night stand that Dylan wrote. And he, ta he says, you know, they walked along together uh, in the park as the evening sky drew dark. She looked at him and he felt a spark tingle to his bones. It was then he felt alone and wished that he'd gone straight. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And, and then he talks about the one night stand. They go to a hotel and, and then uh, he wakes up. The room was bare. He didn't see her anywhere. He told himself he didn't care, right? Yeah. And then, and then he says that it was then he felt alone. Yeah. Right? You know, and this you find, um, you know, even people without necessarily a spiritually or traditionally based shame, you know, model where like, oh, I've, I've just committed a sin. I've engaged with, um, you know, someone who's not permissible for me. Even without that, you know, that, you know, among, um, I can speak to among men, that it's very common that this type of, or even if the woman remains, there becomes an instant, um, like a, a disgust, an instant regret, an instant uh, 
just after the moment of absolute, you know, enthralled, complete, totally immersive pleasure, as if, you know, she's the only thing in the whole world. And then immediately after, it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to even look at you. And this is, I think, another one of the things that is uh, the distinctions between love and lust, like you were mentioning, where, you know, where your mother, as she's growing older, she's only getting more beautiful. Your wife, as she grows older, uh, that, um, that the beauty appreciates, you know. I, and I actually, uh, you know, to that, to that point, um, one of the things that all, since I was young, I would, I would reflect on was that Allah describing himself as, as thankful, as, as Shakur, you know. And I would think, you know, how is Allah, you know, thankful? Like, what, what could, who would Allah thank for what, you know? Um, and then I was reflecting on the, uh, the idea that we are thankful to Allah for what he's given to us, but Allah is an appreciator, you know, which I also understand in a financial terminology. And as he mentions in his book that, you know, if you are thankful, I will give you more. I will appreciate you. Like with your thinking, you will, I will appreciate you and I will increase you and I'll raise you. And so love <clears throat> results in or has in it uh, a sense of uh, thankfulness that lust doesn't, I would imagine. Uh, and so then you find this woman uh, appreciating as you're loving her, as you're pouring your love into her, whatever law is investing in you, you're pouring into her as far as love that she will continue to uh, appreciate and that the love that you have, that you're thankful to Allah and Allah will appreciate both of you and in, in your loving and, uh, and you seeing each other and loving each other and hearing from each other and spending time with each other and knowing each other. Um, that uh, and, and lust, like I mentioned, even among non-spiritual people whatsoever, you know, it's a, it's a common thing to say that once you're, you know, once you've, you know, exhausted whatever you wanted from it, it loses all, it depreciates very suddenly. It depre as, as Dylan was mentioning, there's a depreciation in the actual event of, uh, of lusting as in loving, there's an appreciation uh, of, of that act of loving, you know. Well, also that what you said about the, that immediate regret, and, and I think probably the most extraordinary thing in the English language that's ever been written about lust is, uh, it's the 129th sonnet by Shakespeare, where, where he says, the expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action, uh, is lust in action, and until action lusts you know, until it's actually done, it's lust, is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust, enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight. Like, That's good. yeah. Past reason hunted and no sooner had, past reason hated as a swallowed bait. Mm. On purpose laid to make the taker mad, mad in pursuit, and in having, and in possession so, had having and in quest to have extreme, a bliss in proof and proved a very woe. Before a dream, a joy proposed behind a dream. And then he says, all this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. And it just proves that this is known. I mean, he says it in, in the verse that this is common knowledge. Everyone knows this. You don't have to have, you haven't, don't have to develop any, um, you know, subtle senses of the spiritual reality of things or anything. Layman, you know, everyone knows this experience, yet, like you said, very few know or are willing or have accomplished uh, the, um, to, to find themselves to avoid that bait, as he calls it, you know, uh, to not get hooked on the, on the bait of lust. You know, part of the Islamic tradition was to protect people, men, from their own worst tendency. And so if you look, for instance, 
when it says, Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and to guard their genitals. So the, the eye is a, a direct um, influence on the genitals. You know, that the man is going to be stimulated by what he sees. That's more pure for them. It'll maintain their purity. And then, إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ Allah is aware of what they're doing. Like, just know that He, you know, that He's aware. That, but then it says, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْسَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَضْنَ فُرُوجُهُنَّ So it tells the women to do the same thing, but then it says, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتُهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا And tell them not to expose their adornments, their ornaments. He doesn't say that with the man. It says that with the women. And then it says, well, And let them cover their cleavage. I mean, it literally says the cleavage. You know, the split, the jab. Let them cover their cleavage. And let them not, twice it's reiterated. Let them not expose their ornaments. What this verse is telling us and what a lot of men are saying is help us help ourselves we are weak man was created weak there's apparently in the christian community there's this movement called the first pew boys and these are the young men that go to the church and sit in the first row so they're not distracted by the women in the church because of the way they dress now. So I, what do you think about that? You know, it's, uh, it's interesting because, you know, in, uh, and especially like uh, in the arts, in the, in the communities that I mix in, there is like what you're saying about the um, equality argument. It's, it's very strange because the things that women have complained about, about men for, you know, God knows how long, they have as a sense of empowerment taking on those attributes. So, um, you know, there'll be, you know, there's encourages to like one night stands and compartmentalizing, compartmentalizing uh, sex and emotionality and, uh, and love, you know, and to, which is very strange because the, the standard is male behavior. Uh, but they're seeking to, um, I think it's a poor standard, you know, to be uh, like men, particularly the worst things about men, the things that um, they've described as being uh, uh, painful or ignoble or shameful or um, abusive even. And I have, you know, four daughters. And so they're in school, two of them are in college, and so they're in the mix of these, you know, discourse. And she even talks about conversations in, uh, in class about sex or, you know, raise your hand or who hears a, a virgin or who believes in abstinence or things like abstinence or... But this is the odd thing. The odd thing is if a woman is doing it, and this is something very... Um, even with Muslim women... And I think it might just be a matter of language or framing. But the idea is if you're doing it for yourself, then it's empowering. If you're doing it because of God or because of religion or because of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, then you're oppressed. So just attributing the intention of why you're doing the thing to Allah or to an act of obedience makes it problematic. However, if you say I'm doing this for myself, meaning this is what my nafs has informed me to do, and you do it because your nafs informed you, your, your ego self informed you, then it's, then it's raised as a noble action, strong, empowering, so on. But if it's saying I'm doing this as an act of submission, maybe I want to dress like this or this or this, but I'm, I, I have to dress like this because I've been commanded to dress like this. This has very much fallen out of favor so even sometimes when, and again, these are conversations, very real conversations I have with my daughters. And so I'm not just 
kind of projecting out to just arbitrary, uh, uh, faceless, nameless people in society, but um, of the need that they sometimes feel to say, I'm doing this for because of my because I'm deciding to do it. You know, it's my body. Instead of saying, no, this is not my body. This body belongs to the one who created it. And the one who created it told me to engage my body like this, 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 to do these things and not to do these things. That's the reason I'm doing it. And that reason in and of itself is falling out of favor. I agree with you. I, I think it's, you know, we're living in such a anti-religious time. Like just, especially, you know, spirituality is okay. Like you can be quote unquote spiritual, whatever that means. But the idea that you actually have a religious tradition and that there's commandments that you're actually uh, following and believe in, uh, the idea that, for instance, in the Quran, it clearly states that the reason that the women are told to draw their, um, their garments around them is, you know, and to cover their heads, it's in order that they're not accosted and and the reason for that I mean I once heard um, there was a com comedian who's who was talking about how horrible the women in Pakistan who wore these uh, what he called beehive suits and my Afghani friends testify to the fact that that it's it's actually a horrible thing but that was to protect the women because there's a lot of bestial men in that area and they kind of they do have a, you know, the Arabic word for woman is hurma, which means sanctified or protected or inviolable. I mean, literally inviolable. It's the same word for the haram, same root for, you know, the sanctuary. It's like you don't touch that. And so w most women in our culture have had some negative experiences of being sexually accosted, pinched, groped. Uh, different things uh, by men and and part of the problem I think one is that men are no longer raised with chivalry I mean one of the things that I because I have unlike you I have five boys and one of the things that I really try to instill in them is to honor women and, and I on more than one occasion I told them never degrade a woman but never allow a woman to let you degrade her. You know, don't, it goes both ways. Like there's going to be, unfortunately in our culture, when I was young, I'm, I think I'm older than you, but when I was young, uh, women did not pursue men. You know, men pursued women when I, when I was growing up. That's not the case anymore because of this quote-unquote equality. It's what my father said why would they want to be equal to men? That's setting the bar way too low. It's almost presented as if, and this is both, both, with both men and women, but it's uh, because of traditionally how women engaged with lust. And I think that's why we're mentioning, you know, them in particular right now. But it's, um, it is uh, seen as um, courageous, like you're brave, you know, uh, for being uh, lustful or surrendering to um, your lust is, is, is noble and courageous and brave and you not having any shame and that you've totally liberated yourself from the ability, not just that this act is shameful, that act is shameful, you don't have in your heart the ability to be, to have, feel shame about anything whatsoever. Um, that, that is like a, like the chief makam. That's like, um, the, the high level to ascend to. Um, to get to a level of shamelessness when uh, traditionally, you know, in our tradition and many other traditions that, um, yeah, that is considered the lowest state. If you don't have any shame, you know, then you're, you're below um, animals, you know, you don't, you don't, um, you, you don't get a chance to, to have any of the honor or the dignity of being the son of Adam, the daughter of Adam, that uh, what you, you're removed from any of the benefit from that reality. It's just bizarre. And it's, you know, every appetite. For our, in our tradition, the, the self is a bottomless pit. Like, it just can keep going down and down and down, lower and lower. I mean, 
They will be reduced to the lowest of the low through their appetites. Uh, the commentary of that is we raise them up to the highest of the heights with their intellect and their soul. And then they're lowered down to the lowest of the lowest through their appetites mm -hmm. and their desires. Yeah, I think, I think what you said was key, you know, about in, in the way that you're engaging your sons, you know, and that what I've realized in the conversation around masculinity, femininity, lust, sex, and, and, and the like, is that um, some of the things that are considered, you know, the, the terminology toxic, uh, toxic masculinity, uh, which I, I'm, I'm not a fan of that term. One of the main reasons I'm not a fan of that term is because actual true masculinity will solve a lot of these problems. So like, you know, the, the uh, situation of a man, you know, trying to talk to a woman on the street or harassing a woman on the street, she rebuffs him, he, you know, becomes violent or, you know, things like that. For, 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 for masculine men, we would look at that as shameful. Like, how are you, what, why can't you receive this um, uh, unfavorable response to your, you approaching this woman with like dignity and masculinity and like that, you know, so we would say that that person is ha has a deficiency in masculinity, not, not hyper-masculine, not too much masculinity, but rather it's a deficiency where you would, one, let yourself get that emotionally uh, invested in this stranger's opinion that we would say that you're like a boy. You're, you haven't yet come into your full masculinity yet because you, this woman saying, no, I'd rather not talk to you or no. I, and so the training in masculinity and chivalry, um, although, like you said, in many ways has become unpopular, uh, I think that we have to remain consistent in this because although for some people it may appear that masculinity in and of itself is problematic or masculinity in and of itself is toxic or masculinity in and of itself is dangerous to them, but in truth it is masculinity. For example, if I were to see something like that, my, my masculinity would force me to, to intervene. Like if I saw that interaction happen, it is only my masculinity and my chivalry that would cause me, not knowing the man and not knowing the woman, to put myself in potentially harm's way, potentially a life and death right, encounter right. Uh, to, to stop that. But that's my masculinity informing me to do such a thing. I think one of the things that a lot of women, like we live in a civil society. And so women, I, I don't think a lot of women any here in our culture I mean, they're very aware of rape and, and sexual assault and these things all happen, but it still happens when the, in the context of an overall civil society. But when societies break down, the first victims are women and children. Like right now, as we're speaking, the, these poor Tigre women in Ethiopia, that there's mass rape going on. And, and they, they wish for chivalrous men that would come and defend them. The same happened with these poor women in Iraq when the ISIS took over and took all these people as quote unquote concubines and uh, you know these Yazidi girls. I mean just horrific things. Bosnia, there was mass rape. You know this is an ancient thing. They estimate that German, there were two million German women that were raped by Russian, American and British soldiers after World War II. It's a very common thing that happens in, uh, in fact, I, I read a book by um, uh, General Patton called My War. Uh, and it was, he never finished it because he, he died, uh, but they were his memoirs. And, and I think he was planning on writing the book. But the very first, it opens by him, he's arriving in Morocco, and he, he says, just finished the Quran, a good book, exclamation mark. And, and then, <laughs> and then he talks about meeting with the Sultan, Muhammad the, the V, and he tells him, we have a highly disciplined army, but there's always bad apples. And if you hear of any accosting of Moroccan women by our men, it must be brought to my attention because I will, uh, I will uh, ensure that they are punished to the utmost of the law. 
So that's a problem even with disciplined armies. And the American army is actually very disciplined. But it still happens. Iraqi women were raped. Afghan women were raped. It happens. And so if men aren't taught to really respect women, one of my favorite hadiths is the man who came to the Prophet and said, I want to become Muslim, but I just love fornication. And the Prophet ﷺ said to him, do you have a mother? And he said, yes. He said, do you have an aunt? He said, yes. He said, do you have a sister? He said, yes. He said, don't you know that those women that you're sleeping with, they're somebody's mother, they're somebody's sister, they're somebody's aunt. And then he prayed for him. And the man said, I went in loving uh, fornication and I went out and it was the most odious thing to me. You know, this, this uh, state of, you know, as we, in, again, in our tradition, you know, a man's desire for women is part and parcel of masculinity. It's one of the signs of, of masculinity. Uh, and also it's one of the signs of masculinity to be able to reign it, to be able to, so it's not to, yeah. right. So it's not so much to kill it, nor is it to let it roam free. And this is why, you know, even in our conversations about lust and men and women, uh, the reason, and maybe just because I am a man, the, the reason I'm thinking this way is that I'm always, the most effective way for me to deal with it is always to put the onus on myself. So when I'm thinking about as a man and, and indefinitely in dealing with other men, younger men and men that, or in your case, you know, your own sons, as you mentioned, is that what this age is going to require of them, this age that we're living in is going to require of them is a very high level of masculinity, Muhammadan masculinity, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where, yes, you love women. This is, and, and there's no shyness or shame in that. The men rein themselves in. They allow their, their desire and their love for women to flourish while reigning it. And in that balance, in that tension, is where you find the beauty and the power and, and true chivalry. And, the, and I believe, in my, it's my earnest belief, that if men do that in mass, then that will reestablish the balance of what we are missing. Now, like you said, you know, Iblis is running a number on us, for sure. And so it's not, it's not uh, uh, an easy uh, task at all. But if, we, if men themselves were to hold themselves to a higher standard in their engagement with women, then the, the issue uh, with the women would not be so um, severe, as you mentioned, that you said, don't degrade a woman and don't allow a woman to uh, a woman to allow you to degrade her. So even if women have left off shame, or our culture in general has left off shame, or left off uh, sanctity, chastity, um, that if we instill in our men to, in our boys to correct that balance, it's the only path I can see reasonably that will um, that will rein in and allow for the balance to settle in a more sane place, you know? Because like you said, the discourses of getting women to do this or that, you know, the discourses are, they're not fruitful. I think that's what Dor Dorothy Sayers was getting at, that when a society's in the grip of this uh, deadly sin, that the, 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 least ben the least beneficial thing is to berate them about it. Like you have to address the root cause, which is a spiritual emptiness. Yeah. Um, and, and that gets back to, you know, to Dylan's one night stand where he felt an emptiness inside to which he just could not relate. Right. That that emptiness after the, you know, the attempt to, to assuage that spiritual hunger through a, a, an act that even at the physical level is extremely powerful. Um, the Greeks really understood this. Dionysius, you know, they understood the relationship between sex and violence. 
um, because, uh, you know, they had the Apollonian and the Dionysian. I mean, the great uh, play on that is the Bacchae. Um, and Dionysius is the god of, it's the wild god. And, you know, uh, Nietzsche saw that, that, that these two impulses are in human beings. The Apollonian for law and order. Like Apollo was this god of order. And then Dionysius, that wild, frenzied, you know, the rave parties. Those are bacchanalias. He was called uh, Bacchus in the Romans, so they call it bacchanalia. Uh, drugs, sex, rock and roll. That's all Dionysian. And once that's unleashed in a society, it's a very bad sign. And, and so, for instance, there's a, there's a book that was written in 1936 by uh, this professor from, I think he was at Cambridge, Unwin, U-N-W-I-N. And it's called Sex and Culture. And he studied 86 cultures. 80, uh, 80 of them were more primitive societies. Six of them were highly developed civilizations. He found that whenever chastity was removed from a society, within three generations it was destroyed. And, and he couldn't find, and he was not a Christian. He was a secular rationalist. He actually states it very clearly, but he does admit that maybe religions understood something. The other thing he points out is that when uh, sex is unleashed on a culture, this Dionysian impulse, that what happens is the, the creativity of the culture is lost. And so he shows how it's only cultures that, literally were, were cultures where um, sex was delayed until marriage that produced great literature, great philosophy, great art. He could not find it anywhere in cultures that had open sexual relations. And, and uh, Huxley said, this is an extremely important book that should be taken very seriously. We're moving into the third generation because all of this in America was unleashed in the 1960s. And so we're moving into that. La and you can see, you just wonder how long our culture can survive and what we're doing to these young people, which uh, to me is, is horrifically tragic. It's really interesting what you said about art and creativity because... You know, um, and poets talk, of, you know, poets in the poetry talk about this and athletes and all kind of different people talk about this. But when I was mentioning that tension of maintaining desire, but not just giving into it just willy nilly, giving into it uh, in a disciplined manner is that tension creates creativity, you know, that that it creates inspiration. And so um, when one is just totally free falling into their desires, like you said, and as we're, as we're mentioning, so many people have mentioned, it lends to this emptiness and it's just very uninspired, like you said, just going to sleep because there's nothing better to do, you know? Like it, it drains one of its, of, you know, if we talk about the metaphysical reality and, you know, um, the, the, the Chinese talk about this a lot, this metaphysical reality of, sex and ejaculation and of semen and men and so on. Right, and, and, spirit. And, yeah. Right, and, and maintaining... Yeah, go ahead. Ma ma maintaining this tension is where you can get power. And uh, so not only physically with vitality, but even we've... I've found this just intuitively with, uh, with even with art. And I remember even Miles Davis mentioning this before. Like, if he was to go to... Uh, going to go to a performance... He didn't like to engage in sexual intercourse before the performance, only after, because he wanted that viral energy to still be coursing him, that tension still to be there, and it would light up his mind and light up his heart and inspire his work, and he found that when he exhausted himself sexually before, that his creativity would fall flat or be one-dimensional or be somehow more hollow. So then I never thought of it across like a whole culture that is exhausting themselves sexually at every turn, how that affects the artistic output of that culture. That's, that's what he, uh, he, he, I think he proves it in the book. It's quite a tome to read, but it's, it's fascinating. Um, 
Muhammad Ali was asked by Johnny Carson, um, you know, did he abstain? And he said he had wolves around, like he had all these dogs around the camp and he didn't let women near when he was training. He said he didn't let women near. The Spartans did the same thing. Uh, and what you said about Jing, you know, in the, in the Chinese tradition, that dissipating Jing, too much of it, will invenerate a person to where they're literally completely wasted. Um, and, and a lot, you, you can see this in the faces of rock stars. Um, you know, by the time they're 50, they look like they're 80 because they've just spent their life force. And, and you know, we're, we're, we're told everything in moderation. And I think that's where Islam is such a beautiful uh, corrective for this problem because it really gives us r practical, real solutions to this problem, like just lowering the gaze. One of the things about, we, we haven't talked about it, but I do before we end, I, I want to just, pornography in our culture is so overwhelming that all these poor young people, I mean, I personally have to say I'm really grateful that this type of environment did not exist when I was a teenager or in high school, because I don't know. We, we didn't have access to those type things, but young men that are just coming into that experience of sexual awakening, the temptations are so immense on these poor young people. Their desire, you know, their correct desire, meaning uh, chemically and hormonally what's happening, and their desire for women, desire to see women, the desire to, like you said, that connection that you mentioned from the verse, the connection between the eyes and genitalia. And so that desire obviously is, um, is natural, but what's not natural, not even speaking from a religious point of view, but just in a, you know, uh, in a, like anthropological point of view, where someone could, before they get out of bed in the morning, could see hundreds of naked women. Like chemically, the, the, the brain is not developed to engage that much stimuli and that variety. In a day, I mean, you couldn't count how many either naked women or actual sexual acts that you witnessed. I actually participated in a conference at um, Princeton and I delivered a paper on lust. And, uh, but there was one of the papers that was delivered that just floored me. It was on um, neuroplasticity and the effects that pornography has on the rewiring of the brain. And um, he basically said that it, it will completely alter a person's experience of, of, of reality. Um, and one of the things that Pamela Paul noted in her book, Pornified, and, and I, did, I actually did a program with her called The Rape of the Heart on pornography and its effects. And I, you know, I worked, alhamdulillah, I worked with a Catholic, Robbie George, to get pornography out of some of the hotels. So they actually, we, we got it removed from through a letter writing campaign. Um, but I just, the thing about the, uh, the pornography is that people will end up literally, the, the, the threshold of stimulation gets higher and higher. And so a lot of men, after several years of porn addiction, they go into pedophilia. So these are actually socially harmful um, mechanisms in our society that our, our government should be addressing. And they're not. These are dangerous things. Um, and, and I think a lot of what we're seeing out here, a lot of the violence towards women, you know, uh, I read Chris Hedge's second chapter on his book on um, the Empire of Illusion about pornography, which just, I, om I almost vomited reading it. And, and in some ways, I wish I never read it. One of, the, one of the interesting things, you know, there's these things called the daughters of lust, which are what lust engenders in people that are in the grip of lust. One of the daughters of lust is hatred of God. Like, if, if you're in that world, you begin to hate things sacred. And then you also go into a despair of the afterlife. Just like there's no, you just don't believe that there's any meaning to anything. So it's, it's a real dark um, hole that these people go into. Um, 
You know, one thing that I wanted to uh, cover, because I think it's a really important thing, that the Prophet there's something in, in the New Testament, Matthew, where Jesus says, you, you've heard it of the men of old, that um, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And then he actually advises, like, plucking out the eye. Because he said it's better to go into heaven maimed than, you know, to, to, to be cast into hell because of the sinfulness. I mean, it's a very extreme statement. And whether he said it or not, I mean, I, you know, Allahu anam. But it's, it, it's consistent with the Prophet's hadith where he said, Kutiba Ali ibn Adam nasibun min zina That every child of Adam will have a certain amount of Zina, which is essentially fornication, written for him. And then he said, Mudrikun dharika la mahala. He will have his portion. And then he said, Al ainani zinahum an nadar. The eyes, the fornication of the eyes is to look on, on things that are haram, like pornography and, and, uh, and uh, these type things. And then he said, Wul udhnan zinahuma ristima is to listen to, um, to lewd and lascivious talk um, or sexting and things like that. And then he said, uh, and then the, uh, the yed, zinaha erbach, it's groping. And then he said, zinaha the, the, the fornication of the, the foot is to go to a place where, where those things are going to happen. And then he said, the, the tongue, it's speech. But then he said, The heart lusts and desires. But the genitals will confirm it or negate it. Mm. And so that's the process. If you look at this, and this is what's happening in our culture, the the assault, the, I mean, if you look at the lewd and lascivious lyrics, I mean, people, some of the things these kids are listening to, uh, I mean, just, it's just beyond belief. Yeah, that, like you said, I mean, just uh, the, uh, the shamelessness and the, um, you know, something about our society and like even social media, even when it's not dealing with things that are explicitly sexual or lustful, there is a there is a, a ro an erosion of public space and private space. Scurrility is one of the daughters of lust, also, which is a kind of crudeness, yeah. where there's you know, and lewd speech. The Prophet Sallallahu hated lewd speech. Mm. He said, "Al mu'minu lam yukun al mu'minu." The moment is not obscene, nor does, does he uh, use um, foul language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, you know, this, this, again, is a thing of being, quote unquote, transparent and being real and raw and courageous and truthful. It's presented like this, like I have eroded the barrier between my public self and my private self which is this almost twisted version of Sid, you know, of, of a class of like, it's like this, I'm the same person in public and private. The, the thing that I would, and, and in my small way, wanted to engage, and this is why my poetry is engaging loving, you know, and talking about uh, loving and the virtue of loving and, and the challenge of loving and, and the courage that's required to love and the surrender that's required in love and reintroducing in the context of discourse, you know, very crude discourse to present something, you know, beautiful, to present something in the sea of all of that, like to cause a person to just even for a few minutes, I, I consider it a great victory. And for a few minutes, you know, someone really contemplates the reality of love and its true spiritual, you know, uh, and romantic and, you know, uh, civic reality, you know. Um, and uh, just to give a recess from what we're talking about, this hopelessness and this emptiness and this uh, bottomless chasm of desires that you, it's like drinking salt water. It's like.
We have, we have a saying of the Prophet Isa, uh, Jesus in, in the Arabic tradition said that love of this world is like drinking salt water. The more you drink, the thirstier you get. It's interesting, the converse to that is, you know, sacred knowledge is also like this in a way. You know, the, the more you get, the thirstier you are, you know what I mean? And the more you feel deficient, you feel, it's very strange, as, and, and I believe in this in love as well, the more my love increases for Allah and His Prophet wasallam. It's like if I was swimming um, across an ocean, and on the other side I was going to accomplish complete love for Allah and His Prophet As I swim, the sea grows. So, at one point I may think I'm halfway there, but as I increase in love, I realize I'm a quarter way there. And as I increase in love, I'm an eighth way there. As I increase in love, I'm a sixteenth. So it's like the more I'm loving, and the more my heart has the capacity for love, the more needy I am, the more wrecked I am, the more um, uh, distracted I am, meaning in the distracted by the affair of love, to the point, and you know, the poets talk about this until a kind of bewilderment and insanity takes over a person, you know, because the, um, you can't stop, because it's, it's an interesting idea because it seems as if, you know, in, in our spiritual and religious tradition, like, once you love a law and its prophet, everything becomes easy. That's not true. <laughs> Once you love Allah and his Prophet وسلم, in truth, you can't ever come near enough to them. You know, it's like uh, when a man loves a woman, say they're in two different cities. They're talking on the phone, I love you so much, I, want, I can't wait to we're in the same city. They're in the same city, but that doesn't satisfy them. Oh, I, 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 I want to, um, you know, I want to see you. Let's, let's go to the restaurant, whatever. They, they go to the same place, but they, they still desire for nearness until they come and they touch each other. And then, but the layers between them evaporate until there is literally no space between the one and the other. The one is entered in, uh, upon the other. They become one flesh. They become one flesh. You know, as Shakespeare said, the beast, the beast with two backs. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> but that when you're loving Allah and His Prophet وسلم, likewise, you want closer, clo but you can do that infinitely. You, you'll never, so it's this, um, this desire and this love and this need and this certain, it's a different brand of emptiness that you're having now, but it's like a, a, a level of incompleteness that you're, that you're wanting to draw in Allah and His Prophet وسلم, into yourself in hopes that you will be complete. And then even the idea of golden palaces and rivers of milk and honey, you're like, I want intimacy. I want Allah. I want God. And that is the only thing that's going to quench my desire. Even Jannah itself won't finish me. I need to gaze upon this face. I need to engage this reality. I need to dissolve myself uh, to annihilate myself in this light. And that is the, that becomes the only um, need until the servant it's just the lover is just, is no longer. It, it is a seeking a type of, um, I, you know, the, my last book of poetry was called Love, Gnosis, and Other Suicide Attempts. Uh, about this idea is that it is a desire to be extinguished. It is right. a desire to vanish. Yeah. It is a desire to no longer be because, you know. They call that the Thanatos impulse, which, <laughs> which, which is, it's annihilation. Yeah. Yeah, the ego, the annihilation of the ego. And uh, it's, it's something that our mystical tradition, you know, has always focused on. Um, although we retain the, the beauty of, our, of Abrahamic traditions, for me, is there's a retention of personhood. Mm -hmm. You know, that we, that we go into the next world as so-and-so, the son of our mother, and we're called by our names. There's not, there's not a kind of, um, the, you know, this atma that you just disappear into. Um, but it's a purified self that's removed from all the taints of the world. And um, it's, you know, it's the opposite. It's, it's desire, not lust. And, and desire is a beautiful word because in, in English it comes from a, word, a Latin word which means of the heavens. So God has put in this intense desire in our hearts 
because we want, you know, Augustine said our hearts were created for God and they will not rest except in God. And that's why all this pursuit of lust and all these things, it'll never satisfy the human heart. Uh, it just won't. And, and in fact, Imam, you know, I translated the Burda. I, I'm more of a translator of poetry than a poet, but I've, I translated the Burda. And one of the things he says, in al hawa, you know, like that the hawa, if you allow it to, um, to take over, he says, yusmi al yasimi. It either kills or scandalizes. You know, it'll either kill you or, or, or scandalize you. You know, and, and, and that's, that's what's happening. But we, you know, I mean, I just feel, I'll let you uh, conclude this, but I, I feel that, w that our job, our role it, right now as, as believers and allying with other believers, our, our, is to be what, what the Quran in Surah Hud calls Ulu Baqiya. These are the remnant people the people that sustain the virtues of a civilization when it was on its ascendancy, when it's on its way down. They hold on to, the, you know, they conserve the best of the past. And, and, and chastity is a virtue. It's a virtue for men and it's a virtue for women. And honoring women, you know, chivalry is a virtue. Muru'a, futuwa. These are virtues that we have to hold on to and inculcate into our young people and you know there's a there's an interesting in 1939 when when hitler invaded poland uh, alden the great poet wh alden he wrote a poem called september 1939 and you know when i called my father on the day of 9 11 all he said to me you know my father was a professor of poetry for a period yeah and he, a great shakespearean scholar but um he uh he said to me, read out in September 1939. It's all in there. That's all he said to me, and then he hung up. But one of the things that he says in there is from the conservative dark into the ethical life, the dense commuters come, repeating their morning vow. I will be true to my wife. I will be true to the wife. I'll concentrate more on my work. You know, that, that was 1939, where... That's something that men have to do. I will be true to the wife. That, that is a vow that, that men have to take. Mm -hmm. and, but he ends that poem by talking about our world defenseless under the night, our world in stupor lies. Yet dotted everywhere ironic points of light flash out wherever the just exchange their messages. May I compose like them of eros, desire, and of dust, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. And so I think that's our job is to, to not allow the negation and despair to, to uh, take hold of us and just light that candle in the midst of a, of a dark night. And the beauty of a, of a candle in a very dark room is it it gives off a brilliant light. The, the darker it is, the brighter that candle shines. And the thing that the candle does is the candle shows up the darkness as something that never really existed. It's privation. Good. It doesn't exist. It's the absence. Exactly. It doesn't shatter the darkness or burn the darkness up or tear the darkness in half. Allah Akbar. It just exposes it as something that was never even there. It doesn't exist. Uh, the truth that's come and falsehood that's vanished, the falsehood by its nature is a vanishing thing, you know? Alhamdulillah. You. I, I wanted to mention, you know, one of the things I think that uh, falling into lust as opposed to love is because of the, uh, the investment that is required in love the vulnerability that's required in love. Right. You know, and even with the affair of pornography, even outside the religious context, for a man to like work up the courage to go and like talk to a girl and try to be interesting and try to be nice to her and like all of these steps that you have to go through in order to actually accomplish actual intimacy with her, uh, that the danger, the emotional danger of being rejected or humiliated or whatever, 
uh, cut by just being able to go to the computer or go to your phone or whatever. Um, but uh, but that loving um, requires a courage and it and it requires a breaking and it's in its nature that the heart, in order to open, you know, I say in another poem like a heart, the heart does not have well oiled hinges. You know, it it has to be broken to be open. The, the opening of the heart, I say, um, an open heart is a usefulism for a broken heart. Um, that the heart only breaks open. It's the only way that it opens. Allah Akbar. Um, and so being willing to engage that breaking is like what I said about when I first saw my daughter, that when the heart breaks, you can see inside of it, you see all this stuff that you didn't even know was there. It's such a wonderful world. It's like that lion witch in a wardrobe, like you open up this part of your heart and it's this whole world. And it can be scary and it can feel dangerous. And you can, and I understand why we use the word falling. Um, and love, that it is this disorientation and this strangeness, you know. Um, but there's no way to clothe what I've laid naked. There's no way to hide the burning sun. I'm nearly unconscious, barely existing. Love is pressing me out of living, out of dying. There's no use in resisting. Who would want their heart broken? But now that mine has been split open, I wonder who would want their heart closed? Can you drink from the coconut without striking it? Can you smell the aloes wood without lighting it? There's so much sweetness and violence, so much beauty and breaking. Can you birth without bleeding and crying and screaming and dying? I've been lying, living on the outside of life, bleeding my gums against the coconut shell. Not until I smash my heart and heart against harder rocks that I learn that living is a labor, but dying is an art. And make no mistake, no, no mistake, I am injured, ruptured, my heart, a sweet sun-warmed mango, split open, its juices unruly, flagrant, sultry, fragrant, insane, sacred, noble, and naked, verses like vagrants, strangers in places that were once home. I no longer have one of those. I'm nearly unconscious, barely existing. Love is pressing me out of living, out of dying. There's no use in resisting of beauty and breaking. Alhamdulillah. I'll leave you with that poem. No, no, it's beautiful. Thank you. Sheikh Hamza, thank you so much for this conversation. I mean, obviously we could go for, uh, we could do well, yeah, one yeah. of these every week for the rest of the year. Yeah. This subject matter is so um, important and it can be so disheartening. But, uh, you know, I hope that, you know, yourself and myself and, and the people who are watching this, you know, not to fall into the hopelessness, you know, um, even in looking at this affair, that people are still designed for love. You know, the created in love and by love. That is their natural state. They've That's just been state, yeah. pulled away from it and distracted from it and, and, and taught to fear it or to see it as low. But if we can just, like you said, just light a candle, we'll be amazed how much darkness will evaporate if we can just light even a match. And we'll see that so much of what we were scared of, it's, it, it's not even real. So if we maintain hope and we keep loving the best we can in our small ways and our small worlds, and our big ways in the whole world, then I still think we have a fighting chance, inshallah. Yeah, no, the fitrah is there, the, the human nature is there, but, but it is love, that's where we have to get back to. And I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll give you a parting poem from probably one of the greatest uh, poets of the, um, uh, of that, group, they're, they're Mualladeen, they're the, pe the poets that came after the Jahili poets. But uh, he, uh, this poet, Abu Nawas, was unfortunately, he, as a young boy, he was so brilliant, and his mother sent him to a famous poet to study under him in, in uh, Iraq, and he ended up being debauched by him, and, uh, and he had a really tragic life, you know, became very profligate, and um, w was a victim of his own lust and desire and, and lived a pretty, pretty uh, I think, dissipated life. But at the end of his life, it, it was found under, when he died, these lines were found under his pillow where he, he wrote, Ya Rabbi, in azamat dhunubi kathratan. Oh my Lord, if, if my sins are magnified and, and immense in number, I'm certain that your forgiveness is even greater. 
إن كان لا يرجوك إلا محسن فبمن يلوذ ويستجير المجرم If you only, if only the good people can hope for you, who is left for the criminal and, 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 and the evildoer? I'm calling on you, my Lord, as you have commanded me. I am calling on you, O my Lord, as you commanded in utter humility. And if you turn my hand away, who will show me mercy? I have no other means except hope in you. And knowing that you are a beautiful partner and that I'm a Muslim. <laughs> so even for those in the snares of lust and in, in the grip of their sinfulness, Allah is always there. And, you know, I, I, I've always loved the poetry of Dylan, but I, I once... I uh, saw he, he was honored uh, in Hollywood with an award and he came up and he looked out at this audience and all he said and it was very powerful to me you know they were all these I mean this is such a profligate group of people you know they're all just so dissipated and you know uh, just trapped in the snares of of all seven probably of the deadly sins and and he said that my father told me something and then he hesitated and then and then he uh they everybody laughed and he said well he told me a lot of things and then he said he told me son you can be so defiled by this world that even your parents won't recognize you but just know that god is always there to forgive you Hmm. And I just thought to that group, what a powerful message. So God help us and, uh, you know, just help this, this country and the whole, our whole planet. We need to honor our women. The Prophet Sallallahu said, only, only honorable people honor women. And, and only wretched people will demean women. And, and he said, the best of you are the best to your women. And I am the best of you to my women. So... This is, this is a challenge for all, all, all the men, is to be amongst the good and not amongst the, uh, yeah, the contemptible and wretched.